And it's an amazing thing. They would choose him and then they would watch him for several days to see if there's any kind of defilement with him. It coincides perfectly when Jesus got on an ass and rode into Jerusalem. And as he's there, they're all looking at him, examining him. And as we follow through with the picturing and the imaging, uh, imagery of what this is, it follows perfectly with the days. It follows perfectly with the trials. It follows perfectly with his crucifixion. And it follows perfectly with his burial. It's a stunning thing, brother. It really, really is to understand that. It really is an amazing thing. Now, brethren, listen again. I know there are some brothers who would not agree with me on this. And I still love them. The question is, do they still love me? Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's not the question. But again, to have a good, proper, biblical understanding. Brethren, can I say it? It's not Good Friday. It's Good Thursday. It really is. Biblically and from the Old Testament and from how everything is typed and imaged in God's orderly manner of doing things, it's Good Thursday. It really is. Now look what happens next here as we analyze verse number 43, as we allow the Word of God to speak to us. Look at verse number 43. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, and went boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Brethren, as you read this text, one of the first things that sticks out to me, and I think the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit wanted to stick out to all of us, is the kind of man that Joseph of Arimathea is. Look at his character. Look how the Holy Spirit speaks of this man, Joseph of Arimathea. He's an honorable counselor one who is waiting for the kingdom of God. God used this man. It's a, it, it still amazes me. God led Joseph to ask for the body of Christ, and it put him at great odds. Brethren, listen. In those days when you did what Joseph did, you identified yourself with that person. And it put him at great odds with the Sanhedrin, those people that we've been looking at over and over and over again as Jewish haters of Christ. When he went and asked for the body of Christ, as God led him to do that, he's separating himself from those Sanhedrin, from those evil religious men who did God's bidding in the death of his son. It's just amazing to me. It just, it just stuns me. It marked him as one of their foes. And look at here what the Bible says about him. Look at Luke chapter 23. Look what the Bible again says concerning this man whom God would lead to boldly go and ask for the body of Christ, to link himself to that. It's always funny, isn't it? I've, I've said this before, but, you know, we read the Lord Jesus in Matthew saying to him, hey, when I was in prison, you came and visited me. You realize that's not Jesus saying we should start up, crank up a ministry in the prison. You understand that? Do you know what that meant? When he said, I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. You know what they did? They marked themselves because they associated themselves with those who were in prison. And many times it lined them up next to bring someone food and to care for them was way different than you and I consider it today. It's just like when Peter speaks of us being hospitable one to another. If you understood what Nero was doing to the church and to the Christians, it would have a different view. You'd have a different view of it. It wasn't just, and, and I, I'm glad, I mean, I love to eat food and all that stuff. But that's not in the context of what was happening. Same thing here. When he said, I want the body, he is marking himself as a foe of the evil religious man who are doing God's bidding, killing his son. Look here, if you would, look at Luke chapter 23. Look at verse number 50. Look what the Bible says. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. Isn't that wonderful that God would use such a man? 
that this would be written concerning him. Look at verse 51. The same had not consented unto the council in the deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. Here we see the man whom God used was on the council, and he said, I'm not going to consent to what you're doing. A man of noble character, a noble counselor, God says. God uses him to come and to care for his son's body. Think of that for a moment. It is quite an amazing thing. Joseph put himself in harm's way as the father uses him to fulfill his predeterminate counsels. It's the most amazing thing to me as we see how God is unfolding this caring for this body that will lay in repose here shortly. Look back at verse number, uh, Mark 15, look at verse number 46 now. And again, in ver well, verse 44 again, Pilate marveled that he was dead already. Again, we've talked about this. And called the centurion who was there all that time and asked him whether he was dead. And when he knew it was of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Look at verse 46. Look at this wonderful response as God uses this man who did not consent to their deed, who was a noble character and one who waited for the kingdom of God. Verse 46. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen, laid him in the sepulcher, which was hewn out of rock, and rolled a stone into the door of the sepulcher. Again, as I said, brethren, with loving care, the honorable counselor, with the assistance, and then we're going to look at this, with the assistance of one, a, one, a once a nighttime seeker of Christ, they wrapped his body in linens and placed him in a new sepulcher, the Bible says, where never a man had been laid, amen? You think of how God is caring for, again, his son, the body, that part that's in the grave. That's why it's so central to the gospel, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's why, as it's sandwiched between here, Mark, by the inspiration of God, brings these things out for us to see, because it is a central theme to the gospel of God. I'm going to launch one, Howard. The Lord Jesus Christ did not swoon. Have you heard that? You know the liberals? Do you know what that means? What they teach is that he really never died. He just seemed like he was dead. He swooned. It's crazy what these evangelicals, devils will teach to get around the truth of Scripture. This is why the Holy Spirit is drawing up for us that, listen, when you look at the terminology that's used, Joseph asked, asked for the body. He uses a different word when Pilate turns it over to him. The Bible literally says there that, that Pilate gave him the corpse. He's dead. He's dead. He died, really, literally, physically, like he's going to raise, really, literally, and physically. Not like those demons, as some of these pastors hiss over their pulpits. You know what happens during the Easter season, right? The resurrection season. Well, we don't really know what happened, but it was pretty awesome. No, we know what happened. He was dead. The Holy Spirit directs us to that. He's buried three days and three nights, and he's resurrected, which, Lord willing, we will see that for sure. So here are these two men. Place him in a new sepulcher whenever a man had been laid again so his body could lie and repose for three days and three nights. Look at John chapter 19. Let me show you this. Isn't it funny how amazing how God uses these men? He used the women to do their part. Here he is using the men. Well, the two men who didn't scatter. Look at John chapter 19. Look at here what the Bible says. Look at verse number 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, there you go. He was a disciple of Christ. He followed Christ. This is why God used him, opened his heart. But secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the corpse, literally that word, the body, the corpse of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus. 
Here we go, a couple of men, one who's a disciple secretly, one who comes to Jesus by night, and here's God plucking them right out and saying, I'm going to use you two men to care for this body that my son in the flesh, incarnate God, existed in. Look at there, if you would. And there came also Nicodemus, verse 39, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And they took the body, the corpse of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now, brethren, I'm not going to chase a rabbit. I really would like to. Just so you are aware, you know, you've heard of the Shroud of Turin. You've heard of that, right? They say it's the burial cloth of Christ. <laughs> if you look at the custom of the Jewish burial, there is no way that that can be the burial cloth of Christ. If you look how Nicodemus, when Jesus called him out of the grave, do you remember that? He was buried according to the custom of the Jews. And you know what he came out of the grave with? He came out of the grave with a napkin wrapped about his head and a, uh, several pieces of clothes, the Bible say. Not one. He had a napkin wrapped. You'll see when Jesus raises from the dead. You know what? When they go into the tomb, do you remember what, what they find? That napkin that was wrapped about his head and the clothes laying separately by themselves. Don't be fooled by this goofy idolatry, goofy weird stuff. The Shroud of Turin is no more the very cloth of Christ than, than it is mine. If you know how the Jews buried people, which we're going to be looking at here, Lord willing, it was always napkins, it was always clothes, plurality of clothes, never one piece of cloth buried in a tomb. It did not happen. It's amazing, isn't it, brethren? Sandwiched between his death and resurrection is the Lord's burial. A central truth in the gospel of God. He died. Paul wrote as he was led by the Spirit, For I delivered unto you, first of all, brethren, listen, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was, can we all say it together? Buried. Again, a central theme in the gospel of God. Buried. This morning, aren't you thankful? Brethren, listen. Aren't you thankful that Paul never stopped there at 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He never stopped when he said he died according to the scriptures and he was buried. He also what? Raised according to the scriptures. Brethren, we should be so grateful that Paul never stopped there. It is the death of the burial, and next week, Lord willing, there, well, wait, no, uh, somebody else is preaching. A couple weeks from now, we will see that glorious, unique, unequaled event that's never been done before. A dead man who's laying in a grave three days and three nights by the power of God raises up. Amen? Wow, this is exciting. I don't know about you guys, but this just floats my boat so... Dramatically, Is that a word? I don't know. That is the power of the gospel. You know that he can take you, who are dead in your sins and trespasses, listen, and raise you to life. Wow. That's stunning, isn't it? It is. It's an amazing thing. It really is. These wonderful words that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, I pray will be ringing as sweet, 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 sweet music in our ears. If you're a true believer, they will. They will ring in your ears as sweet melody, sweet, sweet melody. And if God's drawing you, if you're not saved yet, God's drawing you to the cross, you know what? His death, his burial, his resurrection, or resonate in your heart. Amen? That's how he does it. He draws us with the gospel, the power of the death, burial, and resurrection. We believe, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, we trust in the gospel. That's what he said. That's a biblical word. This voodoo stuff that Baptists use sometimes, you know this, right? 
pray Jesus into your heart. Where? It's not in there. But what is in there is trusting. We who first trusted in Christ were to the glory of God. Ephesians 1, right? 12. Ephesians 1, 14, he repeats it. Those of us who first trusted in Christ. That is to believe, to put your faith in the, the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. What an amazing narrative we have. What an amazing truth we have to tell the world. You're dead, but there's one who was dead, who was risen from the dead, who can make you alive. Wow, that's exciting stuff. That's wonderful, amazing stuff. Let's pray together before I start. What, what's that word? Uh, start uh, flatulating or whatever that is. No, not flatulating. Uh, what happens when your feathers come out? I can't remember that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not. Uh, I'm sorry. I totally muffed that up. In that. Oh. Father, we we come before you in most seriousness and most solemnness. This morning, we we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. We thank you for its never changing sufficiency. And uh, Father, we examine just really the the tops of the waves concerning the burial of of Jesus. Father, we're thankful for those whom you used to care for him as he died and then as he was placed in the tomb. Thank you for Mary Magdalene and all the women who were named and thank you for Joseph and for Nicodemus that you would use them for your glory. Father, we, we thank you that he did die, that he died physically and that his spirit did come safely to your presence. And the Father, we, the portion we didn't look at, but um, he also did some preaching in the meantime. Yes, he did. He went to paradise and did some preaching there. Father, we, we thank you for, again, your loving kindness. Thank you for three days and three nights. Just as Jonah said, in fact, you used him as an example, not once, but twice. He said that wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and only one will be given it. That is a sign of Jonah's. As he was three days and three nights in the heart of the great fish, in the belly of the great fish. So I will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And uh, Father, we, we thank you for that wonderful biblical truth. Thank you for that imagery that we can certainly grasp and get a hold of. Thank you for the feasts in the Old Testament as they typed you. As they typed what was going to take place when you put on flesh. That you would be chosen on Lamb Selection Day, the 10th of Nisan, that you would ride an ass into the city of Jerusalem. And they would welcome you joyfully, wouldn't they? Hosanna. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's what they did. And then they watched you. Just like the Jewish people watched their lambs. And Father, then that wonderful sacrifice took place. As the lambs of the Jewish people were being slain, and the blood was being poured out, so your, you were being slain, and so your blood was being poured out and being placed in a grave. And Father, we thank you again for that picture. Now, Lord, we pray for those lost sheep who may be sitting here this morning, whom you uh, will call. They're sheep. They're always sheep. They're just lost sheep, just as I was and just as every one of us who ever come to Christ are lost sheep. Father, you call them by name. In fact, you said they will hear your voice and they will follow you. So, Father, we pray for them this morning that as you call, which you will, the effectual call will take place, and they will hear your voice and they will follow you. 
Father, I pray for the sheep who are here, those who were lost but now are found. I pray, Father, that, this, that the word this morning was edifying to them, that it was helpful to them, that it will sink deep down into their ears. Father, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And Father, it's in his name we pray this morning, that name which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, every one, to the glory of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.